What I actually want to think about is not any of those things, mm. but about whether or not female snakes experience sexual pleasure. Wow. All right. Yeah. Didn't see that coming. But no, all right. you didn't. Yeah. No. Um, maybe I should just leave it there. <laughs> well, it depends. Do you know the answer? There's some new research out oh, that's goodness. actually good. Was it, it a model that decided that they don't experience pleasure because the model told them that they didn't experience pleasure? It's that's, not that. That's right. Well, okay. So I'm actually I'm gonna I'm gonna not say yet exactly what it is. I will I will say um, just a little bit first about uh, phylogeny and about um, character evolution, which sounds you know we start with. Female sexual pleasure, and we're going to character evolution? What the hell? Um, snakes are lizards, uh, which usually even phylogeneticists who study snakes uh, or lizards will, when they're talking about the group that includes snakes, will say lizards and snakes, even though snakes are lizards. So together, the lizards and the snakes are the squamates, the squamata. And um, the squamata have, as every good clade, monophyletic clade, that is, there is, there is a point in time when that clade originated and it is diversified radically and so that clade is monophyletic it includes all of its descendants of that first uh, of that first proto squamate um, and there are characters that is in normal parlance you would say characteristics although evolutionary biologists say characters there are characters that diagnose the clade even though you members of that clade could then lose those characters and that doesn't mean that they lose their um, representation in the clade. Diagnosed so, doesn't mean that the clade is sick. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, so so co things that you would recognize would be that mammals have as these diagnostic characters, synapomorphies in the technical language of evolutionary biology, have, for instance, mammary glands. And, um, uh, but not, um, yeah, mammary glands, but not nipples, because the monotremes, the echidnas, and uh, the platypus. You ain't echidna. At the base of the mammal tree actually don't have nipples, but they do have mammary glands. And fur uh, is a diagnostic characteristic, and that you know you can you can lose your fur as we have, and you remain a mammal. Um, but it was a character that diagnosed um, the origin of, of the clade, and so um, a synapomorphy, a diagnostic, a shared derived character of squamates, which is again lizards and snakes, is having hemipenes, which is two irreversible. Penes, which is really how it's pronounced. I would have said penises, but um, as a herpetologist, that is to say, someone who studies the creepy crawlies that include the amphibians and reptiles, um, I know that you're supposed to pronounce it hemipenes. So, for those of you tuning in late, <laughs> Heather has not had a stroke. She's just teaching you how to speak about the phylogeny of snakes and lizards. Well, I also think it's super amusing to start with uh, sexual pleasure in female snakes and then go immediately into the really dry stuff. Oh, don't be a beakhead. <laughs> which are not. They are not lizards. They're but scissor, they're, no, the scissors. They're sister. <laughs> Tuatara's beakheads, Rhynchocephalians, are, I believe, sister to squamates, if I remember correctly. They, yes, they're not sister to lizards. Oh, I guess I guess they are. Yes, because lizards include snakes. Got it. I've caught up. Now I've See? had my stroke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So hemipenes, uh, which is these shared two, uh, irreversible, meaning they can they can be tucked into the body and they come out. Um, Penises, um, peens. Um, Peni, I think. It's peens, actually, um, that males have on every male squamate, and they're used alternatively during successive mating. So if you've ever seen um, snakes mate, which like I recommend it, actually, it's kind of interesting. Lizards too. Um, they they go at it from the side, and so like lizards will like wrap wrap themselves around each other. And if you are able to watch them long enough, if they don't mind you watching them and you follow them, because this is what herpetologists do in the field sometimes, um, you will see that if the same pair, or even if just the same um, male, you see him mate another time, um, he, will, he will use his other penis. He will use the other side. So um, there's a lot of diversity across squamates, that is, again, lizards and snakes, in size, in shape. Um, other characteristics, like some of them are spiny, some of them have spines. Um, but not all of them, and this has all been known for a long time. Um, I actually didn't look up how long hemipenes have been understood to be the, the, one of the diagnostic characteristics of, of squamates, but it's been a long time. And hat tip here to our friend um, from, from grad school, Jennifer Ost, who pointed me to this new research. Mm. Um, and she, in turn, hat tipped her and my graduate advisor, Arnold Kluge, 
um, because apparently, and I was never, somehow I missed out on his soliloquies about how all of the research into hemipenes um, always avoided talking about the, um, the, the compatible part in females, which would be, um, it's not pronounced hemiclitorises, is, it's hemiclitories, I guess. Okay. <laughs> So here we are. Here we go. Um, apparently, Kluge, my graduate advisor, has been arguing for decades that no, what female snakes have is not just underdeveloped hemipenes, thank you very much. Which, of course, because herpetology, even more than many fields within biology, was very dominated by men for a very long time. And because female genitalia in general is considered like, oh, mm, do we have to? I don't, mm, and it's a little less obvious and all of this, um, to the degree that anything was ever noticed in female snakes. It was usually kind of like, okay, that's just underdeveloped hemipenes, nothing to see there, let's move along. And so, you know, hats off to Kluge for, you know, well before his time being like, no, nah, I don't think so. I think there's something there there. Well, wait a second. Do we have any it, idea how many parties Kluge ruined by mentioning this? <laughs> I suspect, having been at only a very few parties that Kluge was at, that he was the life of many parties. Yes, I, I actually think that he was the life of many parties, and that yes. this probably caused an awkward silence of maybe 30 <laughs> seconds to a minute and a half, and then people would move right along. On the other hand, you invite... Uh, invite Arnold Kluge to a party, you, yeah, you probably know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah, you did it to yourself, pretty much. You did it to yourself. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to read a, a couple of things from this fabulous new paper. Yeah, um, This is published in uh, the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Uh, first evidence of hemiclitories in snakes uh, from out of University of Adelaide, Mount Holyoke, and actually University of Michigan, uh, Museum of Zoology, uh, which was, of course, where um, where Jennifer and I were working with Kluge, and, and he wasn't on your committee, but he would, nope. you were also his, his student. Yep. Uh, so the very first sentence of the abstract of this paper, female genitalia are conspicuously overlooked in comparison to their male counterparts, limiting our understanding of sexual reproduction across vertebrate lineages. I would say they are inconspicuously overlooked. But... <laughs> inconspicuously <laughs> overlooked. Well, conspicuous to some people. Um, the overlooking is conspicuous, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. So later in the abstract, Histology of the hemiclitories in Australian death adders, Acanthophus antarcticus, showed erectile tissue and strands and bundles of nerves, but no spines, as is found in male hemipenes. These histological features suggest the snake hemiclitories have functional significance in mating and definitively show that the hemiclitories, hemiclitories are not underdeveloped hemipenes or scent glands, which have been erroneously indicated in other studies. So first off, just notice the care and the rigor of the scientific argument here. Here's what hemipenes have. Here's what we are finding in the death adders. I love that they use death adders. They actually use nine species, but they went deep on the death adders. Um, that's just so that they would have a story. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's they, like that's well, like they, studying lichen on the face <laughs> of El Capitan, right? Yes. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, I think Let's the, do it in death adders. The, you know, the first author is at the University of Adelaide, so um, although everyone else is, I, I don't know. No, there's two authors in Australia. Um, <clears throat> But they said, okay, so the, the existing hypotheses are it's just um, scent glands or it's underdeveloped hemipenes. If it was underdeveloped hemipenes, you would expect to see the same structures in hemipenes, but less so. And what they're saying is, no, we did the dissections, we did the histology, no, no, and no. It's, it, they're, they're, it's different. It is presumably homologous. Um, the, the hemiclitories in the female death adders, adders and the hemipenes in the... Uh, male death adders, but one is not just a, like a half-assed version of the other, sorry, no. And this is the story of research on female sexuality in general, not just in humans, but in snakes, <laughs> snakes as well. Uh, so genitalia are some of the fastest evolving characteristics of amniotes with internal fertilization. So that, don't get me started on that, but that, that's fascinating Because as well. sexual selection drives rapid evolution. Because sexual selection drives rapid, uh, rapid evolution, but specifically the question of internal fertilization. So, yeah. um, so well, because the shape of the structures then is relevant to the sexual selection. Yes, that's that's. So the piece that I would love to be talking about, but I won't do here for fear of losing more of our audience. 
<laughs> is the conditions under which internal fertilization versus external fertilization evolve, and what happens when you have, uh, you know, once you have internal fertilization, live birth versus egg birth versus ovoviviparity, which is like you have eggs inside your body that then hatch so that you give birth to something live, but there wasn't any placental fetal transfer of, of nutrients or resources along the way. Um, all of these are fascinating, and actually snakes make a, an excellent system for looking at the diversity of um, of within internal fertilization of those types of types of birth. Uh, variation in clitoris morphology has been linked to different degrees of sexual arousal that could lead to increased reproductive fitness by enticing females to copulate or forming social bonds. So this is the authors in the introduction way of saying, guess what guys, this actually matters. Like this, this is relevant, it is interesting, and it does matter if you think you're interested in sexual selection, um, evolution at all really, um, behavior, social bonding, all of these things. Um, and then they say again, even when hemiclitoris are described in lizards, these have been hypothesized to provide a stimulatory role for the male during intromission. <laughs> right? So to the degree that there are like potent, you know, tissues in female genitals that could provide pleasure, no, it's probably just to provide the male pleasure. Like this is literally what's in the literature. Well, it also implies it's a very long movie if there's an intromission. So I will say you know this already. Um, <laughs> intromission <laughs> is different from intermission. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, um, okay, uh, just a couple more things here. Um, unlike lizard hemiclitoris, all snake hemiclitoris examined lacked spines, sulcus permaticus, and retractor muscles, and could not be averted by manual manipulation, suggesting that something different and interesting is going on going on in snakes. And I think there's one more thing. I, I don't need to show the <laughs> clitoris in detail. Ah, um, the presence of erectile bodies with blood cells suggests that the hemiclitoris engorge with blood, while the presence of abundant nerve bundles suggests that their stimulation may provide sensory feedback to the females. So um, maybe that's, that's all I'll share from the paper right now. You can't, of course, um, interview snakes and ask them about their choice of partners or whether or not they're choosing to engage now because they're sexually aroused. But um, you also can't do the kinds of things that you would do in even other mammals um, and look at, you know, basically measure emotion in the same way. You can't, you know, you can't look, you, you can't do the same kind of analyses. So, Especially if you've chosen to do it in death adders, <laughs> it would be dangerous. <laughs> like, can I just have, never mind. <laughs> you just go about your business. Um, but so they've they've done they've done exactly the work that you would you would want to have done if you were interested in whether or not female snakes experience sexual pleasure, which is okay. There's actually structures here, and no, they're not just kind of halfway to what the males have. They're actually distinct structures, and they both have erectile uh, capability and um, abundant nerve bundles, and they seem to do the same thing that clitoris, apparently is the plural, um, do in all the other species um, that have them. And yes, they did it in death adders and eight other species of snakes. Okay, but so, I mean, this is the nature of science, right? Because yeah. each study reveals the next question that you want to answer, but it yeah. sounds like they did not answer the question, all right, You've got snakes with hemiclitoris, but they don't say what fraction of male snakes are aware that female snakes <laughs> have hemiclitoris. Which... Yes, yes, the male snakes are continuing the story that, uh, uh, to the degree that the female uh, hemiclitoris are there at all, it's just to help the males feel better about themselves. <laughs> right, and the, uh, now, only the toxic male snakes are the, saying that. The uh, the male snakes are presumably also possessed of the idea that each individual is the best one that their female snake has ever had. <laughs> That's right, and obviously this conversation is making our female Labrador really unhappy. <laughs> I think she just has to sneeze. 